Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. The theme that was selected for the discussion that we're going to be having over the next couple of days is based on the story of the Song of Songs. And the Song of Songs happens to be the one book in the Bible that is probably the most controversial. For a period of time, there were people within the church who felt like this should be removed entirely from the canon of anything that has to do with Scripture because of just how graphic it is and how scandalous it is. People think that the Song of Songs was written by Solomon, but they're not entirely sure who the author is, and they're not even sure if the person in the Song of Songs references Solomon. And the problem with the book of the Song of Songs is that it describes a love that is contagious and a love that is so powerful and so strong and so intimate that some people felt like there was no room for this in Scripture. But the fathers of the church actually felt like this has to be part of the Scripture. This has to be something that all of the believers read. That even though it is a book of poetry, it is also a book of history. The reason why I say it's a book of history is because it tells the story that exists between God and the rest of His creation. And the problem is that when we read this book, if you do not include yourself in the book, if you don't realize that the book is speaking about you, then you will fail to realize to what extent that story that you are reading is one that points to the relationship that you're expected to have with your bridegroom, with your lover, with your beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we're going to talk about the Song of Songs, and tomorrow when you do your quiet time and you read those first couple of chapters, or that first chapter, I forget if we're doing only the first or the first three, but we'll let the servants decide that. I want you to be able to understand that the book itself, that when you are reading it, from a person who comes from a Jewish background, a hyper-conservative background, that book was scandalous. It was very difficult for someone to read that text and to possibly try to apply it to God. And yet one of the most scandalous things about the Christian faith is that we believe in a God who loved the world so much, and not just a regular love, not just an emotional love, but a love that is truly intimate. A love that is so scandalous that it's the same kind of love that we describe between a husband and a wife. But God loved the world in that way. A love that is so intimate and so powerful that it can only be described as a love that is crazy, a love that is maniacal, that can only exist between a man and a woman. I need you to keep that in the back of your minds as we have the discussions over the next couple of days. That the love that we speak about today is a love that must be defined, because today, unfortunately, more than ever, the word love has been completely hijacked. The word love means so many different things to different people. But we as Orthodox Christians must understand the meaning and the power of that word. And so today I want us to be able to, at the very least, begin by trying to make sure that we all agree on the same definition. If we can agree to the definition of what love is, then we can proceed to having the conversation of what does it mean for us to talk about finding the one that we love. So let's begin with the definitions. There's a secular meaning to love, a definition that is adopted by the world. That simply means what? An intense feeling of deep affection. And people, when they describe this, they simply describe it as what? The relationship that you can find between people who are in the same family, babies, fill parents with a feeling of love, right? No, I am sure sometimes, despite the fact that he's so cute, right? <laughs> sometimes I'm sure he also gets under your skin, but yeah, <laughs> if he hasn't yet, just wait, it'll come. There's <laughs> a different kind of love that is oftentimes described in the world. A great interest and a pleasure in something. When you say that a person loves football, when a person loves a sport, loves a hobby of some sort, or a person or a thing that one loves. She was the love of his life. And today, unfortunately, the way that we use the word, we've given in to this sort of like movement where you can use the word love as flexibly as you want, as charitably as you want. And we drop the word love here and there. And every once in a while, you meet a person who you think, do you know what mitha'ad means, right? A person who is like, he's complex in some way. Because they refuse to say the word love to the person that they're in a relationship with out of fear that you have to mean it before you say it. Then we think that person is like, he's overdoing it. This person has commitment issues. They're afraid to say, I love you. But in reality, I have much greater respect for that second person than the person who drops the word love as if it was meaningless. And today, the language that we adopt sometimes, we use it so freely that we also have contributed to the meaning of the word love to not mean anything as profoundly as it's supposed to be. We say things like, what? I used to love riding my bike. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean I used to love riding my bike? As if riding the bike is something that 
can actually provoke the real meaning of love. We just fell out of love. Have you ever spoken to someone who was in a relationship? And then they just said, I woke up one day and I realized I didn't love him. Eh? <laughs> what, what, do you, what does that mean? What does that mean? What are they implying? What are they implying that somehow love is something that you can gauge? Love is something that you feel inside you as if it was like you have acid reflux and you can tell, oh, that was love. <laughs> I love that guy. Now I hate him. Or when somebody says, I absolutely love this singer or that singer, this actor or that actress, this flavor of ice cream. When I say that love has been hijacked, what I'm trying to say is that ultimately you will notice that the world has used love as a means to be able to create a reality that is completely consumeristic. We even have a day dedicated to love, right? Valentine's Day. Does anybody know the story of St. Valentine? Do you? Can you please share it very briefly? Like, give us like the executive summary. I, I don't remember the exact, but I remember he was the he he's the patron saint of like couples, and he, is it something he like used to help pray for couples or something in a society that wasn't Christian, and he used to help them out, and that's how he became the patron saint, and they named the day after him. Yeah, absolutely. They actually he there was a prohibition against Christian marriage, mm -hmm. and he would literally take Christian couples and marry them secretly, and he would pray over them. And he would make sure that they were still married in the name of the church and in the name of Christ. And when they found out that he was doing this, they killed him by shooting him with arrows. This is where we get the idea of Cupid. Isn't that interesting? Right? What does the world do? It takes something that is beautiful and holy and then it completely hijacks it and finds a way to be able to make money off of it. And the best way to make money off of it is to make you believe that you're supposed to participate in by doing what? By spending money. So love has become, has become nothing more than a tool that the world and the devil will use in order to be able to destroy us, where in reality, the word love and many other things in the Christian faith was always meant to be able to build us up. Now it has become nothing more but that chemical reaction that we feel within us. If the chemical reaction happens, we say, oh, that's love. If it doesn't happen, we say, nope, not in love. We talk about it as if we can describe things that we like. Do you think when I say, I love ice cream, does it have the same meaning as when I say I love my children? I love my children. I have Mikey and Maria. I love Mikey and Maria. Do you think it means the same thing as when I say I love my wife, Tina? I sure hope not. That would be awkward. <laughs> it can't be the same kind of love. So when you fast forward and you read the epistles of St. John, and then he says, God is love. What definition is he adopting? What does he mean when he uses that word love? So when we say, or when we read Song of Songs, and it talks about finding the one that we love, what is that supposed to mean? When you understand that the word love has become hijacked, and today more than ever, we were just talking about this in the car on the way in, how it is that there are so many things that have been hijacked by the world, and now the world even uses terminology like what? Love is love. Yeah, you're so cute. Love is love. Love is love. Really. You see what the devil will do is that he'll take something that ultimately belonged to God and he'll make you believe that it's real. But the real intention behind what it is that he is doing is that he's leading a person to ultimately hurt themselves and sin. Love is the very word that the apostle uses in order for him to be able to describe God. St. John doesn't say God is loving. He doesn't say God is lovely. He says God is love. He's the very essence of love. Any real love is founded in Him, anchored in Him. It can only exist in Him. And yet today, we use that word love, and it creates such a huge distance between us and God. Remember that the devil's intention is to be able to create deception. Will he make you believe that something is worthwhile, good, something that you should chase, something that you should grab a hold of, only then to have you realize that what? You fooled yourself. You thought it would satisfy you. You thought it would complete you. You thought it would bring some sort of harmony or peace or comfort. And instead, what has it brought? Absolute disaster. Instead of joy, you have sadness. Instead of light, you find yourself in a state of darkness. And instead of going closer to God, you find yourself having been distance. This is why in the liturgy of St. Gregory, St. Gregory, what does he say? And when he fell through a deception of the enemy, who is he talking about here? Who is it that fell through a deception of the enemy? 
It should be relatively easy. It's in the first half of the book of Genesis. <laughs> Who is it that fell? Adam. But here's what's really interesting. When St. Gregory writes his liturgy, at some point in the language that he uses, he begins to speak in a way where he is Adam. Even to the point where he says what? I plucked for myself the sentence of death. I didn't pluck anything. I wasn't in the garden. I didn't reach for the fruit. But what does St. Gregory realize that we don't realize? I am in Adam. I continue to make the same mistake that Adam made. I continue to fall into the deception of the devil, believing that somehow the word love can mean anything and everything I want it to be, even if it's outside of God. You see, definitions are important. Meanings are important. Again, on the way in, we're having conversation because we had what felt like a 16-hour car ride. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry's up in a driving car. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't her fault. <laughs> so we're having this conversation and we were talking about how it is that one of the most important questions that we're supposed to ask whenever and whenever we are in dialogue with anyone is what do you mean by that? So when somebody talks about this idea of the one that we love, holding on to the one that we love, that Christ is our beloved, what do we mean by that? Definitions are important. Because if we don't have the same definitions as God, if we don't have the same intentions as God, then everything that comes out of our mouth after talking about love is going to be erroneous. It is only if we have the definitions of God that then we can make sense of things. What does St. John Chrysostom say? Does anybody know who St. John Chrysostom is? Show of hands if you've heard of this guy. Wonderful. Excellent. For those who don't know, 4th century patriarch of the city of Constantinople, his name was John, originally from Antioch, and they gave him the title Chrysostom. Chrysostom is not his last name. It's a title. And the word Chrysostom literally means of the golden mouth. Why? Because everything this guy said sounded like a mic drop. He was so good at everything he said, to the point where they said everything this guy says is gold. So they gave him the title of Chrysostomos, of the golden mouth. So what does St. John Chrysostom say? He says, what kind of love are we talking about here? It is the true love and not simply what people use this word to mean. Notice that he's saying this when, 4th century, yeah. we've had this problem ever since the foundation of the world. The devil has been deceiving us using language from the very beginning. It is the true love and not simply what people use this word to mean. It comes from our attitude and knowledge and must proceed from a pure heart. For there is also a love of evil things. Robbers love other robbers. Murderers love each other too. Not out of love which comes from a good conscience, but from a bad one. When we speak of love, what do we mean? Where is it coming from? When we are going to be talking about love over the next few days, let's all make sure that we have the same definition. Let's all understand that the love that we speak about is the one that we see in the person of him who John says he is love. So imagine if you wish that you had an orthodox Google. You know how you can go on Google and you can do a quick search? You know how sometimes you have the tabs of news, images, videos, and then you can click on whatever, right? I want you to imagine that you wrote love in an orthodox Google. Alas? And you clicked on images. What images would come up? Jesus. The cross. The cross. No. You think you'd see a really cute picture of like a guy and a girl staring into each other's eyes? Is that what you think? You think you'd see pictures of flowers and like teddy bears and stuff that you can buy on Valentine's Day? What would you see? As scandalous as it is to us, the real meaning of love is what he did on the cross. You have to understand there is a reason why the world is scandalized by Christianity. There is a reason behind why it is that when we speak of love, we don't think of things that are exciting our emotions. We think of love and we immediately think of a person who is the very author and the standard of what it means for us to love. This is why John, in his gospel, insisted on writing down the very statement of Christ when he's speaking to who. Who did Christ say this statement to? John 3.16. Who was he talking to? Does anybody remember? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. And what does he say about the love of God? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But now imagine, you're reading this statement and you know what it means to say He gave His only begotten Son. You know what the ending is going to be. So when He says He gave 
His only begotten son, you know that it ultimately means he was offered as a sacrifice on our behalf. Nicodemus didn't understand that. Nicodemus had no idea that the man that he was speaking to loved the world so much that he was going to offer himself as a ransom on our behalf. Those are the very words of Christ. The Son of Man must be offered as a ransom. Why? For the salvation of the world. You and I know the end story, and I sometimes feel like because we know what he's going to do, that we water it down. We act as if we already know what's going to happen in the last chapter. It's like not being excited about a movie because somebody spoiled it. Somebody already told us the character dies. So ugh. you watch the entire movie knowing what? That yeah, dude's going to die. But you got to remember, when he said this to Nicodemus, when John heard this and wrote it down, he had no idea how profound this statement was. I would love for us to be able to go to a place where we can allow his love to shock us all over again. To go back to a place where his love can scandalize us. To go back to a place where you don't even have preconceived notions of what he means by what he says. John doesn't stop there. John goes on even further in his epistles. And he says in 1 John chapter 4, it's in chapter 4 that he describes this whole idea of God being love. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And he who does not love does not know God. Why? For God is love. And then he continues in that same chapter and says, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. You see, John believed that God is love so much that he's willing to use God and love interchangeably. Whoever abides in love abides in God. Now, please try to understand this. If a husband were to tell his wife, I am in love with you, what is he supposed to mean? It is because of you that I am in God. What you provoke within me is to be in God with you. This transcends any ridiculous notion of emotion. Get over the chemical stuff. Get over the feelings. Feelings will fade away. You are called to love despite your feelings. And you are called to recognize that God loves you despite the feelings that you might provoke in Him. Let me ask you, do you guys know, I love this passage, this is one of my favorite passages in the, in the Gospel, because you see that Christ is a well-balanced individual. At some point he walks into the temple and he's completely, completely devastated by the sight of evil that is happening in the temple. So what does he do? He tells his disciples, sit them down, and then he told them, what, have you please don't do this, this is not nice. That's what he did, right? No, nope. you know what Christ did? And I love Jesus for this, because this is where Jesus shows that he's a real G. He walks in, he flips over the tables, <laughs> right? And then the gospel says something that is unbelievably, uh, that it would be completely unacceptable in today's progressive and like politically correct world. It says, he fashioned the whip. He fashioned the whip. You know, that's like, that's like my father taking off his exam, right? He fashioned the whip and he says he chased them out. He chased them out, getting angry. Now let me ask you, what was his emotion in that moment? Was it not anger? Absolutely, it was anger. And it was righteous anger, zealous anger. Did he love them? Yes. The love that we are speaking about has nothing to do with emotion. The love that we are speaking about is choice. Where you must make a decision that if you love, that means that you choose. You ever hear that passage in the Old Testament where it talks about Esau I have loved, es um, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated? You know what that means in the original Hebrew? It has nothing to do with the emotion. To hate something is to not choose. To love something is to select it, to choose it. So what is God saying in the Old Testament when he's talking about Jacob and Esau? Saying the one that I have chosen is Jacob, even though Esau is what? The firstborn. The birthright technically belongs to him. But I have loved, I have chosen Jacob. So when you say, I want to love God, this has nothing to do with your emotional state. 
This has everything to do with your willingness to choose Him. Every moment, regardless of how difficult it is. So when we say we want to find Him, this is so deeply connected to the fact that you must first choose Him. And many of us are stuck at thinking that our spiritual relationship with the Lord, our maturity, our growth, can only be evaluated based on how much we feel. I am here to tell you that feelings are probably the most handicapping aspect of the spiritual life. Forget how you feel. Nobody cares how you feel. If nobody has told you this, let me be the first piece to tell you. Habibi, your emotions and feelings are meaningless. Zero. This whole idea of, oh, no, I pray, I pray, but I feel nothing. Abuna, I used to feel, now I don't feel. Manahe, God has abandoned me because I feel nothing. You think you pray so that you can provoke feeling? Sorry. Sorry. Is the carpet okay? No, yeah, it's closed. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm going to use children as an example. I promise I, I don't mean to pick. Okay? And I, I just want you to hear what I'm about to say, but let me finish, okay? Because what I'm about to say is going to disappoint or hurt some people's feelings, which I already told you I don't care. <laughs> you know how some people say, no, you have, to, you have to mean it when you speak? You know how some people apologize, you're like, no, you didn't mean it. What, what, how, are you, how are you evaluating whether or not, because I didn't feel the apology. <laughs> how can I help you? How can I help you? Do you think something is only acceptable when you... Feel it? Time. In the very beginning, a mother who loves her child, okay? Excited about her child. So in love with this like gift of life that God has given her. Halas? Wakes up in the middle of the night and is so excited. Why? Because she gets to nurse her child. She presses her child up against her and she's so happy. You know how long this lasts? Probably the first six hours. <laughs> A few weeks into it, when the mother is like completely sleep deprived, and she hates her husband because he gets to sleep. Tell us, just saying, man. I, I, and has to sleep. But see, you think the mother wants to get up in the middle of the night when it's week twenty-one, when it's been like six months of me doing this now, and I'm completely sleep deprived, and this baby seems to only wake up hungry when I finally fall asleep. If the question is, do you feel like you want to do it? Absolutely not. So why do you do it? Because I love him. This has nothing to do with feeling. This has everything to do with choice. My love is expressed in the fact that I do it and I choose him. The same way that God had absolutely no good reason to love us. Forgive me. God has absolutely no good reason to love us. We of all of his children... We're probably the most despicable, if we're being honest. His choice of us has nothing to do with what we do. It has nothing to do with our behavior. It has nothing to do with whether or not we are righteous or unrighteous, because He chooses us regardless. So when we say that God's love is unconditional, He literally means it. He says, I'm going to choose you regardless of what happens. But I can only help you if you choose me back. And this is the entire story of the Shulamite and the Beloved, when you read Song of Songs tomorrow during quiet time, you're going to be introduced to a woman. And this woman is oftentimes called the Shulamite. And this Shulamite woman meets her Beloved, and she describes her Beloved in a great amount of detail. And she talks about how her Beloved calls on her, and how he loves her, and how he desires her, and he runs after her. But there is a turning point in the story where the beloved comes running after her, but she doesn't answer swiftly. She takes her sweet time, and by the time she answers, he's gone. And then she is devastated. So she runs the streets like a crazy woman, asking everyone, have you seen the one I love? And they tell her, who is it that you speak of? And so she describes him in absolute beautiful detail. But she is devastated over the fact that she has not held on to her beloved. But he comes back to her, and they embrace each other. And this is what the church 
introduces to us as the very story between God and every human soul. Every person who reads Song of Songs is the Shulamite. But over the fact that she has not held on to her beloved, but he comes back to her, and they embrace each other. And this is what the church introduces to us as the very story between God and every human soul. Every person who reads Song of Songs is the Shulamite. Every man and woman is the bride. He is always the beloved. He is always the bridegroom. Always. So what does she say in chapter 2? The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He is looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. The whole purpose of the conversation that we're going to have in light of Song of Songs is that even though today's topic, tonight's topic, is focused on the idea of you finding Him, let me be very clear. All you're doing is responding. You initiated nothing. He is always the one who initiates. He is always the one who came running after you. You only know Him because He first loved you. Your response in choosing Him is only reciprocal to the fact that he has first chosen you. The Shulamite here, every human soul, is responding and saying, what, he came after me. He's the one who cried up and said, what, rise up. Rise up, my love, my fair one. Why? Because I want you to come away with me. I want you all to myself. She continues in chapter 3, and this is where she references the idea of what? I must find the one who came running after me. She says, by night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. I will rise now, I said, and go about the city, in the streets and in the squares. I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. And every human soul can relate to this idea can relate to the fact that they know that it is Christ who pursued them, that it is God who came running after us. But there are moments in our misery, in our suffering, in our moments of weakness and darkness, where we feel that He is absent. And God forgive me, sometimes we even have the false impression that He has what? Abandoned us. And yet He promises that that's never the case. We mistake his silence for his absence. The Lord is never absent, ever. There is nowhere you can go that you can hide from his face. There isn't a single place where the heavenly king is not present and fills all things. We know he is present. What drives us crazy is his silence. And so we mistake his silence for his absence. So we act like the Shulamite who was overtaken by that love that she has for him, where she desires him with all of her heart. And she says, when I find him, I will not let him go. How do we know that he loved us first? How do we know that we're reacting? How do we know that it was him who initiated? And this is important. There are so many other religions out there where the burden of finding the person in the relationship it is always on humanity being forced to find their creator, their deity. Nowhere, nowhere, not a single religion talks about a God who loved his creation to the extent where when they could not find him, he came down to them. Why do you think people are so scandalized by the story of Christ? That the Father and the Spirit would be in perfect harmony in choosing with the Son that he be incarnate. Why do you think this is scandalous? Do you understand that even Christians in the history of the church, patriarchs and bishops alike, found it absolutely scandalous to suggest that his love allowed for him to humiliate himself? Bishops and patriarchs in the church who turned out to be heretics 
What did they say? You cannot say that he was born of a woman. What do you mean? God cannot humiliate himself to that extent. What do you mean he nursed at the breast of Mary? What do you mean he was a child who grew little by little? What do you mean he felt pain? That he needed sleep? He needed food? What do you mean that God died? And those people would accuse us and say, what? Absolutely not. That is humiliation. And our answer to that is, absolutely. We believe in a God who first loved us to the extent where he did not even deprive himself of absolute humiliation. A humility that St. Paul describes in the book of Philippians as the very mindset that we should have in ourselves. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who did what? Who did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he condescended. He left his glory. He came down. He took on the form of a servant, and he was obedient even to the point of death, and not just any death, but the death of the cross. So what does scripture teach us about this humiliation? The his love that he had for us first. It says in the book of Jeremiah, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. There is no way that someone could have loved God unless it was first God who initiated. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, St. Paul says. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The love that we speak about here cannot simply be something that is limited to the chemical reactions that we have within us of feelings. It is something that is so much greater. So when you speak of your beloved, it cannot simply be the one that provokes feelings within you, but rather it has to be the one that you choose. You see, St. Augustine understood this very clearly. Does anybody know the story of Augustine? Does anybody know how old he was when he was baptized? T tell me anything you know about Augustine. Anything. Go ahead. He was like 50. Sorry? He was in his like 40s or 50. He was a little bit younger. Yeah. He was well advanced in years. You're absolutely right. He was in his 30s. His mom prayed for him. Yes. Why did she pray for him? He was lost. Yeah, he was a complete disaster. <laughs> he was a complete disaster. Uh, according to our according to our terminology today, he, he was constantly, he was constantly under the grip of sexual abomination. He was a sex addict by every meaning of the word. This was a young man who was so intellectually, like he was brilliant, brilliant, to the point where he would read the Bible for the sake of finding errors in it and mocking Christians. He was absolutely brilliant. But he lived a life where he was completely overtaken by his addiction and his sin. But through the prayers of his mother, he ends up meeting a very blessed bishop in Italy. Does anybody know who that bishop was? Ambrose of Milan. Yeah, Ambrose of Milan. And here he met a man who was so intellectually advanced that he could not believe that such an intelligent man would be a Christian. And it was Ambrose who discipled him. But he refused to get baptized. You know what St. Augustine used to pray all the time? He would say, Lord, send repentance. Just not now. Why? Because he was honest enough to know that he was not yet done or satisfied with his sin. Until one day the Lord willed that he saw people literally coming from a different part of Africa. He was in Hippo. At this point he was, or he was no, he was still in Rome, I'm sorry. He was still in Rome or in Milan at this time. And he ended up being the Bishop of Hippo, which is in uh, is it Algeria? Tunis. Is it Tunis? Or somewhere in that, uh, <laughs> in that area. He sees a whole bunch of people coming off the boats. And the evangelists are preaching to them at the harbor. And on the spot, after preaching to them for a few hours, the people who had just arrived declared their faith in Christ and they're being baptized on the spot. And he was so overwhelmed by what he was seeing. And he thought to himself, how long, how long will it take for me to finally give in? How are these people who are unlearned, 
who don't know what I know, who haven't even read the scriptures, being admitted into the kingdom of God, while I sit here and wait because I still embrace my sin. And then finally he went to Ambrose and he was baptized. So here Augustine writes what is known as his confessions. And in the confessions of Augustine, he expresses something. Are you closing the windows? Is that okay? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Are you guys cold? No. It was me, it was me. It was you? I'll move. <laughs> it was me, it was inside. You. Could you? Let us swap, Seth. Yeah. I'm warm. Well, I'm warm. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> How have you? That is so controversial. We've kind of made this class up. What were we saying? St. Augustine. Yep. St. Augustine. His confessions. His confessions. So he writes the confessions of Augustine. And he's like super vulnerable. It's this big book where he talks about everything he's been through. Everything. He literally confesses publicly in this book. And in his confessions, he says, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. It is only when he chose God that he finally really experienced peace, or he finally experienced rest. Now, however, this is not something that is foreign to us. When we talk about finding our beloved, and we have plenty of examples, not just Augustine, of those who chose him and searched for him, and when they found him, they finally rested. If I were to ask you, give me examples. Give me examples from the New Testament that finally encounter Christ and encountering him, they never want to let him go again. Who do you think of other than the apostles? The apostles are easy. Now let's set apart the apostles. What other encounters do we have as examples where when they find their life is turned upside down? When they finally meet him, the Samaritan woman. Give me one more. Mary Let's put Mary Magdalene with the apostles, right? As a matter of fact, Mary Magdalene. One of the titles the church gives her is Apostle to the Apostles, but we'll get to that. Mary Magdalene. She doesn't get enough credit with us. But... It's okay. It's okay. It's very good. So let's talk about this for just a second, okay? These are two of the most frustrating stories in the New Testament for me. So let me tell you why. I don't think we fully grasp to what extent this scene at the well. Like here they make it look beautiful. She's so submissive and kind and gentle, right? <laughs> when you actually read the text in light of how this encounter actually happened. No, no, she, she was treating him the same way that she would treat any other man who probably had like secondary interest in speaking to her. She just found him to be just as despicable as anybody else. Not to mention the fact that he wasn't even a Samaritan. The Samaritans and the Jews would be the equivalent of us talking about Jews and Palestinians today. They don't get along. This already, seeing this is something that would be so scandalous for the disciples, to the point where they couldn't believe, Yanni, what are you doing? <laughs> Some of the disciples would speak to Christ as if like, in the you can't be doing what you're doing. Not only are you speaking to a Samaritan and you're taking us through Samaria, but now you're stopping by and you're talking to a woman. What he's doing here is something that cannot possibly be fathomed by those who follow there. And he goes and he waits for her specifically at the well. Knowing that she comes and hides at the well at a time where she did not want to be seen. There's a sentence in the gospel that talks about how it is that she would go to the well midday. midday. Nobody goes to the well midday. Why? Sorry? Absolutely, because of the heat of the day. You see, today when you want water, what do you do? You walk up to the faucet and you do a quarter turn. Unless they would have to walk a significant distance. And the water that they would carry would be in humongous jugs that were made out of clay or stone. And these women would have to carry it on their backs, attached to some form of stick. They're walking in the middle of the day, so everyone would go when in the, in the beginning of the day, when it was still cool outside. But she goes when nobody else is there. Why? Because she does not want to encounter anyone. As they say in Arabic, Mishtai Ahad. She refuses to see anyone. She wants to avoid people and be avoided. But he knows exactly when she would show up. Tell me who's running after who? Who's chasing who? Who is calling the other to come away with him? 
We are the Samaritan woman. Do you know what her name is? I'm just actually curious. Does anybody know this? She has a name, by the way. Saint Right? And she dies a martyr. Saint Futini. Saint Futini. You know what Futini means? The bearer of light. Do you know why the church called her Futini? Because in this encounter, once she met him and tasted his love, she never let him go. She went and brought that light, that love, to everyone in Samaria. And the gospel ends by telling us that almost every single one of them was converted because of her preaching, saying, come and meet a man. Come and encounter him who is love. Zacchaeus says the same thing, but this one is much more frustrating to me. Why? <laughs> because we have absolutely no idea what he told Zacchaeus. We know nothing of what they talked about when they went to supper. Nothing. All we know is what he did was so incredibly offensive to the Jews who must have been there. Do you understand what it means to be a tax collector? Who here has watched The Chosen? The Chosen did a good job of being able to show people what a tax collector does. Well, here's the thing. To be a tax collector means that you are a rat. You are literally like, you have sold out your own kin. You work for the enemy. And what would Rome do? Rome would say, okay, there's a thousand people in this area, we want a thousand denarii. Figure it out. Get us one per person. Anything you collect above that is yours. So how do the tax collector make their money? Rome wants a thousand, one per head. I'm going to collect two. One for them, one for me. And the people knew this. The people knew that this person was benefiting off of their misery. And if you didn't pay, I have goons, I have the soldiers. Rome provides me with muscle. And I'm going to use this muscle to be able to take it out on you. So why were tax collectors hated? Because they would benefit off the misery of their own people and work with the enemy. What does a chief tax collector do? Yo, he's got minions working under him. He's like, you know what? Collect three. One for Rome. One for you. And one for me. And I'm going to set you up with everything that you need. It's like a pyramid scheme, if you know what this is. <laughs> Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, not just hated, absolutely abhorred. And because of his short stature, he just wants to be able to get a glimpse of Christ. But he does the unthinkable. He says, tonight we're having supper at your place. Come down and do it quickly. Do you think it was accidental that the Lord walked the streets of Jericho? You think it was just on the spot thinking where Christ just spontaneously decided, let's do it at his place. He looks nice. Who was chasing who? Who initiated? And then we know nothing about what happened next. We know Zacchaeus says yes. And then we know they had supper. And then out of nowhere, Zacchaeus drops this line that makes virtually no sense. Zacchaeus says, Lord, if I have taken anything, from anyone unjustly, I will pay it back how many times? Four times. And everything that I have taken unjustly, I will pay it back. Do you realize what Zacchaeus is saying? Because Lord, I'm going bankrupt. For you, and after meeting you, I'm going bankrupt. Do the math. Somebody do the math, please. Well, the Sherry works at the bank. Does she work at the bank? Does anybody here? Is, who, who's good at math? If you collect a thousand dollars off of people, and then you pay them back four times as much as you collected. You are instantaneously what? Bankrupt. You're giving back more than what you collected. But Zacchaeus couldn't care less. To the Lord, what did you tell him? What was the exchange at the table? What made a man like that suddenly say, I have found what I've always wanted? Now that I have found you, I'm not going to let you go. I couldn't care less about what I've been collecting. I don't want any of it anymore. All I want is you. Take everything else away. What did he tell him? You see, the Holy Spirit didn't see it fit to tell us what he said. But we know what he encountered. He encountered love. In the flesh. It didn't say that Jesus loved him. But Jesus was love to him. David the psalmist picks up on this very quickly. Even though he never saw Christ, he understood the love that he was supposed to have for his God, Elohim. He understood 
that Jehovah was a God of relationship. He understood that the God that he wrote psalms for was a God who loved him. So the psalmist writes and he says what? Well, as the deer does what? Pants for the water. So my soul pants after you. So my soul desires you. So my soul reaches a point when I feel famished, all I want is you. All I want is you. So what does the deer do? When it's thirsty, when it desires that water, it follows the sound of the stream and it runs to where it can find what it is that it has been searching for. If you and me don't have that same reaction, we won't find him. When you feel unloved, should you not love, run to the one who loves you? When you feel that you are lacking peace, should you not run to the one who we call the king of peace? The image that I would love for all of you to be able to have at the back of your minds right now is the image of the animal who knows that if it does not pursue a solution to its thirst or its hunger, it will what? It will die. It will die. C.S. Lewis says this passage. Actually, is it C.S. Lewis? No, the author is anonymous. We don't know who it is. Whoever this author was, writes and he says, when God created fish, he placed them in water. When God created the animals, he placed them in the field. When God created the birds, he allowed them to roam in the air, knowing that that is the very habitat that they needed to survive. But when God created humanity, he created humanity in himself, in his image and likeness. The fuel that you run on, what is supposed to satiate you, satisfy your every desire, is God. Nothing else. In case there is any doubt, about what this relationship looks like. In case you are still questioning what does it mean for me to find God, let me make it that much more clear. The God that you believe in is one who waits for you to answer. He says in the book of Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, what will he do? Notice how it is that Christ says, Behold, I stand at the door and I kick it down. He doesn't say, behold, I stand at the door and I'll remove it off of its hinges. Why? Because I love you. No, our parents do that. <laughs> our parents will love us. <laughs> they will find a way to be able to love you in spite of you. They'll force it on you and then tell you, it's because I love you that I'm strangling you. <laughs> oh, doesn't do this. He doesn't. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Whoever opens the door, he says, I will come in. And I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. So what does the Shulamite say? Long before the Lord says these very words, she expresses the very thing that the Lord himself expresses to us in the book of Revelation. She says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks saying what? Open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. You don't have to answer if you don't want to. And to be very clear, he won't force you to. He won't kick down the door. He won't do anything that obliges you to choose him. But if you choose not to answer, he remains at the door and he continues to knock regardless. I want you to imagine that you believe in a God who that while you say he is almighty, he is Pantocrator, he will still surrender himself 
to your will. You understand that you have the authority to say to God no? You understand that? He could tell you, I want you. I know this is best. I know that you will benefit from this. I beg you to say yes. And he still allows you to be able to say no. He says, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For those of us who want to find him, for those of us who desire to hold on to him, the response should be that we reciprocate his love. Tomorrow, by God's grace, in that second conversation that we'll have tomorrow morning, we'll talk about what it actually means for us to hold on to him. Today, everything was about finding him, or at the very least, responding to the fact that he chases us and he tries to find us. Tomorrow, we'll talk about what it means for us to hold on to him. But if you leave with anything tonight, anything at all, I ask you to leave with these two things. If you are going to say that you love God, it has nothing to do with your feelings. It has nothing to do with whatever it is that causes an emotional reaction within you. If you love God, then choose Him. And if you choose Him, recognize that you are reciprocating. You are not initiating anything. It is Him who loved you first. It is Him who chases you down. It is Him who knocks. You love Him by opening the door and letting Him in. If you do this, then you are like the Shulamite. You are like the one who in her love goes crazy, desiring to be with the one who has loved her first. To God be our glory now and forever. And to the ages of all ages. Amen. I think this next period is dedicated to any questions that you guys want. We can talk about this conversation or any other conversation that was inspired from this talk that we just gave.